Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. So in the present session, we will continue our discussion on product pricing, we will discuss few more kind of pricing and then we will sum up our entire managerial economics course since we have covered all the topics whatever we thought of covering in this typical course. So to start with, if you remember in the last class, we talked about uh, the product pricing, uh, mainly when the pricing is done on the basis of the uh, product life cycle and on that basis, we uh, generally talk more about the product scheming and uh, then uh, we discuss about the pricing based on uh, side like cyclical pricing, pricing based on this input output relationship, then we talked about the Ramsey pricing and the transfer pricing. So, we will discuss uh, some uh, more types of uh, product pricing now and to start with we will talk about peak load pricing and in case of uh, peak load pricing, it is a kind of price discrimination typically in which consumers are segregated on the basis of time segment. So, here it is not the same kind of pricing for the different consumer group, rather it is a different, con different kind of price discrimination, different kind of pricing for the different consumer group. So, it is a part of price discrimination, so rather than it is a pricing technique, we can say it is a price discrimination technique what we and in this case generally we load, uh, we uh, use this peak load pricing. So, this is the kind of price discrimination which segregate consumer into different group on the basis of the time. So, it is like user of consumer or user in a typical uh, time period will charge more, user in the typical time period will be charged less. So, in this case different prices are charged for the same facility used at different point of time by the same customer. So, even if it is the same customer when he uses the product or when he uses the service at the different point of time, different pricing he has to uh, pay. So, typically this uh, segregation is on the basis of the uh, time and here on the basis of time zone, the entire time zone is divided into two types, one is peak load and another is off peak load. And in case of peak load, generally higher price will be charged and uh, here the pricing model is markup pricing and in case of op peak load generally op peak load pricing where there will be lower price will be charged and the pricing is based on the incremental pricing. So, the entire time zone is divided into two kind of time zone one is peak load another is op peak load, peak load where activities are high and op peak load is when the activities are less. So, activities are low high in this case it is a higher price for the product or higher price for the service and the pricing is on the basis of the markup pricing. And in case of off peak load, generally where the activities are bit less, there it will be lower price and in this case the pricing technique is incremental pricing. Then uh, the typical example of uh, peak load pricing is like if you remember uh, during the initial days when the cell phone service providers were there or uh, generally with the time period it they used to charge a different uh, uh, different uh, pricing like first 100 minutes maybe you know you get a free services then uh, next 100 local to local the next 100 uh, minutes will be charged in a different price and the call up more than 200 units will be charged in a different price. Similarly, when this yesterday prices if you look at uh, there were a different pricing from morning 6 to 8 then 8 to 9 and again from 9 to evening 7 o'clock, it is the peak load pricing because that the activities are more and that is why it is a higher price and after 7, 7 to 9 there is a cha one, one third, one, uh, half of the uh, actual price and after uh, 9 o'clock or after 9 to 11 generally we used to get one third and after 11 o'clock we used to get one fourth. So, on the basis of the different time of the day generally the yesterday uh, rates were uh, varying and this is generally the example of the peak load pricing where in the off peak load generally 
prices are less and in, in case of peak load the prices are more. Uh, similarly, if you look at typically in the that is not being practiced in uh, India, but in some foreign country, uh, the energy prices are more, the electricity charges are more during the uh, peak hour, during the business hour and energy prices were less during the off peak hours. Then we have the uh, sealed breeze uh, build pricing strategy. Here it is a kind of separate market altogether, buyer do not prefer the open price and demand sealed price from the seller in a sealed form. The typical example is tender here. So, this is the example of limited monophony when there is only one, uh, one buyer and the number of sellers are many. In this case buyers do not prefer a open price or the open market price. They ask the seller whatever the prices they are going to charge for the product they have to give it in the sealed form. And looking at the price generally they will uh, decide the buyers will decide from whom they are going to buy. This specifically happens in case of the monospony buyer and also typically all these government offices and the public utility services where the regulatory authorities generally they ask for the quotation from the different seller that whatever the prices they are going to charge for doing a specific job. It is always in the sealed form typically known as the tender price and uh, we always follow the uh, lower tender price people generally if you look at this the regular practice that the if someone has quoted a lower price, lower tender price generally they gets the deal. So, the typical example of sealed bid pricing strategy is uh, uh, the tender which is generally happen in case of the limited monospony and also in the government offices where the accounting uh, accountability is very high. Uh, then uh, in case of sealed bid pricing strategy, Markup generally it is follow a markup strategy and markup strategy where there is a cost of production plus some margin. But here the challenge comes what should be the margin because if there are 10 bidders and each of them they are bidding for it, the when they decide the margin they cannot quote a lower price, lower margin because it may happen that when they are quoting a lower margin and that leads to a lower price which looks unrealistic and which gives an impression that they are not going to go, uh, they are not going to give a qualitative job. So, in that case also, case also they are not going to get the tender and also in the case of high bidding price when they put up a high margin they are not going to get the tender because that looks uh, like in a, a in a very high uh, level. So, margin is generally fixing of the margin is challenge in case of the sealed bid pricing strategy even if they follow a markup pricing because it is a it is not a open price rather it is a closed price. So, it is difficult to know the what are the margin of the other competitor who is bidding for this uh, typical goods or the typical services. Then we have uh, retail pricing and how retail pricing is different from the producer pricing or the wholesale pricing. What is the uh, value chain over here? Producer generally produce the product, then they send it to the wholesaler. So, producer sold uh, generally sells the product in one price to the wholesaler and from retailer buy from the wholesaler and sell it in the market. So, every time there is some value addition and if you look at whatever the prices charged by the producer, it is not going to be the same by the wholesaler, they will add their margin and from wholesaler when it comes to retailer that is again their margin is being added and finally, whatever the price we get that is the maximum retail price if you have seen in all these product it is written MRP is this much. So, a mar maximum retail price and in the maximum retail price generally the retail commissioner is the commission of the retail is added over here. So, retail pricing is one at that price generally the consumer buys the product from the uh, retailer and in case of uh, maximum retail price the retailer commission is added. Now, what is the technique for this uh, retail uh, pricing or what is the pricing technique generally followed by the retailer? One example is the everyday low pricing that is generally known as the EDLP and under this technique generally a low price is charged throughout the year and there is no special discount. So, typical example if you look at generally we call it the uh, big bazaar or whether it is the Walmart or whether it is the dollar store or whether it is the EG shop there are number of uh, ch chain if you look at number of supermarket they charges low, uh, low uh, price constantly throughout the year 
and in that case there is no other discount rather than because they are charging a lower price throughout the year and this pricing strategy is known as the everyday low pricing and here also the consumer have the understanding that if you are going to that particular store they are get they are every throughout the day uh, throughout the year every day they are paying a lower price for all this product as compared to the other product. Then the other technique is high low pricing and high low pricing is the high prices on the regular basis coupled with discount to promotion the product. This is generally followed by the uh, retailer typically the brand they when they want to make it a branded product generally they always say that since it is a good brand they have to follow a uh, high price. Uh, they have to follow a high price on the regular basis, but they give some discount to promotion the promote the product. This is typically adopted by farms which have a high overhead expenses cannot afford low pricing. The typical example if you look at the whether it is about good brand, whether it is about Taniskar, whether, uh, whether it is about any good brand of garments, every day they charge a higher price because they charge that price for their brand. And on a particular day or on a particular occasion they give discount when they have to promote their product. Then in that uh, technique we have one more pricing that is known as value pricing where it is the value for money generally they say that uh, uh, what is the perceived value attached to the product. Retail, the retailer generally they take a judgment on the basis of the perceived value of the product from the consumer point of view and on that basis generally do, they, they do a value pricing. If the consumer is giving a uh, having a very high perceived value for the product they charges a high price and if it is a low perceived value they, they generally charge a low price. Then we have administer pricing and administer price is generally related to price charged by the monopolist and therefore determined by the consideration other than marginal cost and prices are those that are statutorily uh, determined by the government this is typically known as the administer price. Then we have export pricing and export pricing comes into picture because there is international transaction taking place after typically the when the international trade is there or the uh, when the uh, liberalization and the globalization has taken place and international trade either we import the uh, product where we have to make the payment the domestic economy has to make the payment and or it is exported so where we receive the payment. So, when the export price is fixed uh, in this case the uh, determinant for the export price is need to check where this product is getting exported, what is the income level of that country, what is the test and preference of the consumers of that country, what is the exchange rate between the currency of that uh, country where the transaction is taking place and the domestic currency, what is the tariff and custom duties in that country to do the trading identify and also to identify all the competitors who supply the same product in the same market. Because export price is something where the domestic product is getting sold in the foreign market. So, pricing is not on the basis of the domestic business environment rather this is on the basis of the foreign country's business environment where the product is getting sold or where the product is getting exported. So, that is why here the exporter when they are fixing up the price they need to consider what is the income level, what is the taste and preferences, what is the exchange rate, what is the tariff, customer duty and also one of the important factor they have to look into that who are the other competitors or who are the other supplier who is exporting the product to that particular region or that particular location. So, with this uh, we, uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, completed our discussion on the product pricing and if you remember in the product pricing we discuss about the uh, different kind of uh, pricing that is based on competition, that is based on the goal of the firm, that is based on the cost, that is based on the cyclical changes, that is based on the product life cycle. And also we talked about two uh, pricing, basically one is the multi product pricing where pricing is decided on the basis of the combined marginal revenue and the second one is the price discrimination which is generally practiced by the monopolist when they charge different prices to the different consumer group in different market and different time period. So, with this we completed all this topic whatever we uh, listed in the uh, this typical course or whatever has to be covered in this typical course. Uh, 
Uh, and now we will uh, do a summing up of the entire topics whatever we have covered in this particular course. And uh, to start with uh, if you remember we divided the entire managerial course into four modules and module 1 will talk about basically introducing the different kind of uh, economic concept, economic principle and the econo basic uh, tools required for the economic analysis and the optimization technique. Module 2 talks about the demand and uh, supply, typically demand supply, elasticity of demand, the consumer behavior and the demand forecasting. Module 3 is theory of cost and theory of production and module 4 is market structure. So, we will try to summarize each module on the basis of whatever the key concept we discuss in the in each of this module. So, if you remember uh, in the very first class as we discussed this is uh, in we introduced the subject economics the what is basically economics and if you remember economics is it is the study of choice and valuation or the study of the scarce resources. And from there the concept of managerial economics came because uh, generally using the economic theory, economic principle and with the decision making tools, uh, manager uh, try to solve whatever the business decision problems and that gives us the optimal solution. And since all the economic and managerial, managerial decision, it is uh, uh, it is related to the basic problem, basic economic problems of the country uh, of the economy and what is the basic economic problem because there is a, a different, there is a difference between the unlimited human want and the scarce uh, resources available to satisfy those want. From there actually the basic problems of the economy or the three basic question what the manager faces in the farm level and what the economy faces or uh, as a general level for the whole country is what to produce, how to produce and for whom to produce. So, all the managerial business decision problem is somehow in the broad level related to this three question that is what to produce, how to produce and for whom to produce. And managerial economics or the managers will try to uh, what is the job of the manager, the manager job, job of the manager to is to direct the resource to resources so that the uh, firm can uh, achieve the goals or the achieve the objective. So, in this case generally the managerial economics where it is a study of resources, here the manager when they use the study of economics to do the direction or the resource direction to stated objective that is generally the managerial economics. And then we discuss few basic concepts that is getting used in the economics uh, analysis and economic understanding that is one is uh, two basic assumption that is one is economic rationality and second one is Satori Paribas. Satori Paribas talks about the fact that other than study variable other all other variable has to be remain constant and it uh, and the second assumption second basic assumption is economic rationality and here the assumption is that all economic agent that is consumer producer seller they have to be rational in their decision they have to rational in their behavior then we discuss about the opportunity cost this is the benefit from the next best alternatives because and why this opportunity cost comes because there is no unlimited resources to satisfy unlimited wants Generally, the economic agents they uh, do a valuation of their alternative and on that basis they use the resources. So, it is not that all the wants get fulfilled or all the alternatives for all the alternative they have resources and uh, that is why this opportunity cost comes whenever we uh, use the resources to for one alternative we need to see what is the opportunity cost of using that resources and opportunity cost of using the resources is always the benefit foregone from the next best alternative. Then we discuss about the concept of profit. Concept of profit is basically uh, the concept of economic profit and the uh, accounting profit and about that where to th we need to add the implicit cost and where implicit cost is not going to added. Then we discuss about the marginal analysis and incremental analysis. Marginal analysis is generally the difference between the total or the addition to the total whenever the new activity is done whether it is a marginal cost, the cost additional to the total cost, marginal revenue addition to the total revenue by selling one more unit marginal cost addition to the total cost by producing one more uh, one more unit of the 
output and then incremental analysis we discuss in that con, uh, context where it is not when the change is not uh, per unit when the change in the chunk generally the, the, uh, then the study of incremental change comes and that is typically known as the incremental analysis. Then we discuss about the functional relationship between the economic variable that is in term of linear, nonlinear and polynomial function. Then we discuss about the slope and how slope is getting used in the economic analysis basically to study the relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable. Then we discuss about the derivative of various uh, functions. and. Then we discuss about the optimization technique, typically the constant optimization and constant optimization either it is a case of profit maximization or the cost minimization case. So, we, uh, we, uh, we understood the substitution technique and the Lagrangian multiplier method to do this profit maximization and the cost minimization typically in the optimization technique. Then the regression technique is being covered and in the regression technique we cover the estimating the error term, ordinary least square method, testing the significance of the estimated parameter and test of goodness of fit. Then module 2 talks about the theory of demand and in this module uh, the discussion started about this by defining demand, then the law of demand, law of demand essentially talks about that how price and quantity demanded they are related. So, other things being remaining constant, the, the quantity demanded and price they are inversely related. Then the demand schedule basically the uh, numerical value assigned to both the price and quantity demanded in a different time period that gives us the demand schedule. Demand curve is the graphical relationship between the price and quantity demanded and demand function is the uh, the formulating the function on the basis of the uh, relationship between the dependent and the independent variable. Then uh, the factors affected demand has been discussed that is mainly apart from the price there is some non-price factor also affects the demand and uh, on the basis of the factors the change and shift in the demand takes place. Whenever there is a change in the price that shift the uh, that shift the demand from along the demand curve from one point to another point and whenever there is a change in the non-price determinant of the demand, the demand curve shift until to the right in case of increase and left in case of decrease. Then supply and law of supply is been discussed and in law, sub, uh, law of supply is again other things being constant, there is a positive relationship between the price and quantity supply. Supply schedule is the uh, numerical value representation of supply and the price in the different time period. Supply curve is the graphical representation of the relationship between the supply and price and supply function is the mathematical relationship between the supply and the price. Then there are a few factors which identify uh, affects the supply and the change in the shift in the supply is related to these uh, factors. If it is price, then the supply is uh, shift in the supply is along the supply curve from one point to another point. Whereas, if there is a change in the non price determinant of the supply, then the sh supply curve shift to the right in case of increase and shift to the left in case of decrease. Then, uh, the intersection of demand and supply curve is generally leads to the market equilibrium. And market equilibrium is one where the de market demand is equal to the market supply. So, price and quantity they are inversely related, but what is the magnitude of change in the quantity demanded whenever there is an increase or decrease in the price that is being studied through the price elasticity of demand. So, this talks about the responsiveness of the consumer to change in the price and corresponding to what is the change in the quantity demanded. Then income elasticity of demand, income elasticity of demand is again the change responsiveness of the consumer or the responsiveness of the quantity demanded due to change in the income. And then cross price elasticity of demand essentially talks about the uh, relationship between the change in the price of the substitute goods and or the complementary goods that is related goods in production and what is their effect in the quantity demanded. So, if uh, price of the substitute good is changing then the quantity demanded of the present good is increasing and if the price of substitute good is decreasing then the uh, 
uh, quantity demand that is uh, again decreasing over here. So, cross price elasticity of demand essentially talks about the magnitude of change in the quantity demanded when price of the related goods that is either substitute or complementary changes their changes. Then consumer behavior is being studied on the basis of the utility analysis. Utility analysis is two types, one is cardinal, another is ordinal, where the utility can be major on the basis of the units called util that is generally uh, cardinal utility analysis, where utility cannot be major that is only ranked on the basis of preference that is ordinal utility analysis. On the basis of ordinal utility analysis, uh, the indifference curve approach has been studied and indifference curve uh, is nothing but the locus of different points or that gives the combination of two goods which gives equal level of satisfaction. And indifference curve has few properties that has been discussed and then the law of diminishing marginal utility is discussed and law of diminishing marginal utility states that other thing being equal when the consumer go on consuming the products, uh, the utility what he receive from consuming that product that generally goes in a negative direction. Then the budget line is being discussed and budget line is nothing but the individual budgets what he can afford to the uh, effort from the uh, uh, combination, the, con the product combination and the budget line is being discussed and the basis of the budget line and indifference curve, consumer equilibrium is, uh, consumer equilibrium can be found under, consumer equilibrium is the point where the slope of the budget line is equal to the slope of the indifference curve. Then law of equimarginal utility is discussed which talks about the utility what we get from the uh, by uh, by, pr by uh, from from the different product that has to be same that is the ratio of the marginal utility of both the ratio of marginal utility and price of both the goods has to be same at any point of time if one is more than the other the consumer will spend more on the that product where he gets a higher level of utility when the change in the uh, price uh, takes place, it has two effects. One is the change in the quantity demanded and also the change in the other product. So, in this uh, context, the price, income and substitution effect has been discussed and the uh, price effect is always a combination of the income effect plus the substitution effect. Then at the end, the consumer surplus, uh, concept of consumer surplus has been discussed and concept of consumer surplus is a situation where this is the uh, difference between what consumer is ready to pay for the product and what actually he is paying. And this difference is generally known as the consumer surplus because consumer is ready to pay more, but whatever the market price for the per product that becomes less. Then the demand forecasting is being discussed and demand forecasting in term of two methods, we discuss about that what is the need for the demand forecasting what are the steps in the demand forecasting and two methods, one is the qualitative or the subjective method like the consumer opinion survey, market simulation, test marketing that in the subjective method and in the quantitative method we talked about the econometrics method, train projection method, barometric method and the smoothing techniques to understand that how demand forecasting is being done uh, following the different method in the different situation. Module 3 talks about theory of production and cost here uh, the uh, uh, topics related to the production and cost being covered. So, this uh, theory of production uh, the definition of input, output and production and the to start the uh, to start the topics we did the de uh, defining input, output and production. Then production function, different kind of production function, then short term production function and law of diminishing return. So, short term production function is uh, analyzed with the law of diminishing pro uh, return or the law of variable proportion. And law of variable proportion talks about three stages of production process on the basis of relationship between the total product, average product and the marginal product. And for the rational producer, it is always ideal to produce in the stage 2 of the production process because stage 2 is the uh, stage 2 is the stage where there is a efficient utilization of both the uh, input that is fixed input and variable input. Since this is a short term production analysis, one unit has to be fixed and that is why there is a fixed unit and stage 2 is one where there is a efficient utilization of both the fixed input and the 
uh, fixed input and the variable inputs and uh, all the rational producer they prefer to operate in stage 2 of the production process. Then the long run uh, production analysis is uh, discussed with the help of return to scale and return to scale uh, talks about three kinds of return to scale that is the uh, constant return to scale, increasing return to scale and decreasing return to scale. So, constant return to scale is one where the change in the output with respect to change in the input the proportion is remain same. Then in case of increasing return the proportional increase in the output is more than the proportional increase in the input and in case of decreasing return the proportional increase in the proportional increase in the output is less than the proportional increase in the input. In that context also the homogeneous production function is being discussed. Homogeneous production function is one where it takes a value equal to 1, it is a constant return to scale. Degree of homogeneity or this generally when the degree of homogeneity is 1, this is a linear homogeneous production function, it is a constant return to scale. If the degree of homogeneity is greater than 1, it is a case of increasing return to scale and if the degree of homogeneity is less than 1, this is the case of the decreasing return to scale. Then isoquant and isocost is being discussed. Isoquant is the uh, indifference curve of, if you look, uh, remember this indifference curve of the consumer theory, the same indifference, uh, indifference curve this is the product indifference curve and it, uh, it, it is the locus of point of two different input combination which gives the same level of, iso, uh, same level of production. Isocost is the line which gives the different combination of the product whatever is being used for the whatever is being used for the production process. Slope of ISO cost is the ratio of the input prices and slope of ISO quant is its a ratio of the marginal product of capital and labor if the production function consists of two inputs capital and labor. Then choice of input per combination is being discussed in the case of maximization and minimization using the Lagrangian multiplier as a constant. Then expansion path uh, is being discussed looking at the producer equilibrium at the different uh, different ISO cost and ISO quant level and then economic region is being discussed because uh, ISO quant is one it is a no, if it is a normal ISO quant generally one input can be substituted for the another input and that is why at all point of ISO quant we get the same level of output. But up to how long this uh, inputs can be substituted? Uh, substituted to one to another and which one is the efficient region of production uh, that we discussed through the economic region of production. Then this model covers about the uh, cost typically the production cost. We discuss about the types of cost that is accounting uh, that is required for accounting and economic analysis. Then cost and output relationship then the short term cost analysis where there is one fixed cost and one uh, variable cost. And uh, in the short run all the cost curve is U shape except the average fixed cost because average fixed cost is uh, generally rectangular hyperbola it never touches any of this axis. Then the long run cost output analysis is being discussed uh, and long run cost output relationship basically that why the long run average cost curve is U shape. Then we discuss the long run marginal cost curve and how long run average cost curve also serve as a planning horizon uh, for the producer and it also calls as envelope curves because it envelops number of short run cost curve in the different time horizon. Then break even analysis is being discussed on the basis of linear cost and revenue function and non-linear cost revenue function. So in case of linear cost and revenue function the profitable region is uh, generally there is infinite till the time the firm can get profit till the time the revenue is greater than the cost and here we get only one inflection point where revenue is equal to cost. But in case of a non-linear cost and revenue non-linear break even analysis there is a range has been identified where the firm can maximize the profit on the basis of higher revenue and lower cost and it is not there is a limit and on that basis this range has been decided. Here we get two inflection point where total revenue is equal to total cost one at the beginning and one at the end of the profitable region. Then contribution analysis learning curve has been uh, discussed then application of cost analysis in the different uh, function then cost function empirical de determination and finally the economies of scale where we discuss about the 
real economies of scale and pecuniary economies of scale. Pecuniary economies of scale is the basis that while long run average cost curve is decreases because, uh, because of advantage of economies of scale and pecuniary economies of scale talks about uh, the ad cost advantage in the term that the input price is less and that is why there is economies of scale. But real economies of scale there is less uh, usage of the physical input and that is why we get the real economies of scale cost advantage. And real economies of scale has production economies of scale, then technical economies of scale, managerial economies of scale and also the sales and marketing economies of scale. Then we discuss about the dis economies of scale, dis discuss dis economies of scale is basically uh, contributing that while long run average cost curve is increasing after the minimum point and it is noticed that the maximum dis economies of scale generally comes from the uh, managerial dis economies of scale and that is why there is an increase in the cost of production. Then the last model uh, talks about or the it discusses about the theory of market and the pricing practices. Uh, so, the classification of market, definition of market, classification of market on the basis of different parameters is being discussed and the focus here is on when the market is classified on the basis of entry condition, the product and what is the uh, what is the competition level on that basis the classification is done. So, the first kind of market uh, form of market is perfect competition, we discuss about the feature of perfect competition. The demand and revenue, short term equilibrium, market supply and farm supply analysis. So, perfect competition is the one extreme form of market where there is no competition at all and the what the all the firms they are the price taker, price decided by the demand and supply forces, they maximize the revenue by selling more output. The equilibrium condition is same again, this uh, they always follow equilibrium condition where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue and on that basis generally they identify the price in the corresponding mm -hmm. demand curve. The supply curve in case of uh, perfect competitive market is uh, typically the uh, defined through the marginal cost curve that is the segment where it lies above the minimum point of the average variable cost. Then long run uh, profit maximization is seen and if short run is someone if the firm is making loss at least long run they get the normal profit. So, there are three kind of situation the firm gets uh, either they get a normal profit or they get a loss or they get a super normal profit and perfect competitive uh, we uh, also discussed that what is their application in the real world taking the example of the stock market and credit card industry. Then the second kind of market structure is monopoly, this is another extreme in the market form. There is only one seller, one seller and large number of buyers as compared to the large number of buyers and seller in the market. Then then the regions and the types of monopoly discuss that how the market form emerges as a monopoly market, then the demand revenue of the margin monopoly firm discuss and also the price and output is done in the short run and the long run. Then we discuss about the supply curve of monopoly firm, if you look at there is absence of supply curve of the monopoly firm, then the measurement of the monopoly power is done using different methods like learner index, HHI index, market concentration and also on the basis of the uh, cross, price, cross price elasticity of demand. Then uh, multi-plant monopoly is talked about like the, when the monopoly has different plants to produce the output. Then monospony, uh, monospony form of market is discussed where it is just reversed to the monopoly market where there is one, uh, one buyer and the number of sellers are man, many. Then the bilateral monopoly is being discussed when there is one buyer and one seller and then some real world evidence has been taken for the monopoly and then the comparative comparison between the monopoly and the perfect competition. Then the ideal mix of monopoly and perfect competitive market structure is the monopolistic competition. So, the discussion is on that monopolist, uh, monopolistic competition on the basis of determination of price and output in the short run and the long run. The significant feature of monopolistic competition is the product differentiation. Uh, where there are large number of farms, but all of them they produce a differentiated product because 
uh, all of them they produce a differentiated product, their product is different from each other either on the basis of the quality, on the basis of the service associated with it or on the basis of packaging or on the basis of the content. And since they have some freedom about the product differentiation also they decide the uh, price of the product. Here the competition is mainly on the basis of non-price rather than price because each of them they advocate that their product has different in term of the other product. Monopolistic competition has taken some feature of the uh, perfect competition and some feature of the monopoly. Then the um, uh, oligopoly market structure is being discussed and here typically the feature of oligopoly and there is one significant feature of oligopoly is the interdependence between the farms in the market. And when it comes to interdependence in the farms in the market, it is in two way, one is where they compete with each other and other when they collude with each other. So, when they collude with each other that kind of uh, that kind of oligopoly generally known as the collusive model of oligopoly and when they compete with each other that generally known as the non-collusive model of oligopoly. So, we discuss about the Cornot models, Stackelberg model and King demand curve approach in case of a non-collusive model. When the case of Diopoly, how the Diopoly is basically the case of two sellers and large number of buyers and we examine all this non-collusive model taking the Diopoly farm. So, Carnot model talks about the fact that even if the farm knows that the uh, whatever they, the other farm is going to change their uh, pl revise their plan and pr output and price till they believe that they are going to follow whatever they are in the past period and they continue uh, they go on continuing the same behavior and finally, in that case part they reach to a suboptimal solution rather than the optimal solution. In case of Stackelberg model, it is a leader follower model generally one firm act as a leader and set up the price and uh, set up the output and other firm generally follows it. King demand curve talks about typically the price rigidity, how increase in the price is not matched by the competitor, but decrease in the price is always matched by the competitor. And in that case, uh, the whatever the firm, uh, whatever the demand curve the firm face, it has a kink on it and the corresponding marginal revenue curve has gap, always the marginal cost pass through the gap and that is why there is no change in the price by the firm. So, king demand curve model typically talks about the uh, price rigidity in the oligopoly market. In case of collusive model, we discuss about the price leadership model, cartel. Cartel typically the centralized cartel and the market sharing cartel and we talked about the price leadership model uh, that is on the basis of the low cost price leadership, dominant price leadership and the barometric price leadership. Then uh, since uh, there is a group behavior in case of the oligopoly market and there is a interdependence between the firm, their behavior is the strategic behavior known as the strategic behavior because what is best for one firm that is always uh, depend on that what the other firms doing on their price and output plan. So, in that context the game theory has been introduced to understand the economic behavior. So, the game theory is discussed on the basis of the assumption the structure of the game, structure of the game covers from the players to strategy. Then the types of game on the basis of the end outcome, then the strategy of the game in terms of pure strategy max min min max dominated dominant strategy. Then one of the important contribution of game theory to the economic analysis is the Nash equilibrium and the Nash equilibrium has been discussed uh, taking uh, into the both where there is a dominant strategy for the player and when there is a absent of the dominant strategy of the player. So, Nash equilibrium talks about that, that what is the uh, this is the point, this is the uh, this is the point where this is the best outcome to the player irrespective of whatever the other players does in the whatever the opponent does in the market. Uh, then the prisoner dilemma is uh, discussed which is an interesting phenomena of, uh, of the fact that where cooperation is beneficial, it is difficult to maintain cooperation and that is why the players whether they are the individual, whether they are the firms, whether they are the country they reach to a suboptimal solution where they are not getting maximum profit. But since cooperation is difficult to maintain and even if cooperation is beneficial, they are not getting into the cooperation and they are reaching into the suboptimal solution. 
Then this game theory is discussed uh, on the basis of its applicability on the market entry game. Typically, when the market is, uh, when the firm is trying to enter into the market where a monopolist firm is facing, what should be the strategy for the monopolist firm that is existing firm and what should be the strategy for the entrant firm. Then Cornot and Stackelberg model, what kind of game, whether it is a simultaneous game, whether it is a, a sequential game uh, that generally discuss in case of the Cornot model and the Stackelberg model. Then the last topic uh, for this course was on uh, pricing practices, typically we, you know, the multi-product pricing and price discrimination is being discussed. Price discrimination is uh, uh, basically discussed that when the monopolist charges uh, different prices to different consumer group in the different time zone and different market. On that basis, uh, three type of price discrimination is discussed that is first degree price discrimination where the price is charged on the basis of willingness to pay and in this case the firm's motivation is to take out the consumer surplus from the consumer. Second degree price discrimination where the discrimination is on the basis of quantity not on the basis of price and typically this is an example of the meter pricing. Then the third degree price discrimination where the market is segregated on the basis of the consumer responsiveness on the elasticity of demand and always higher price is charged in case of inelastic demand, uh, inelastic market and lower price is charged in case of the elastic market. Then pricing practices is being discussed that is on the when the pricing is on the basis of the cost, pricing is on the basis of the competition, pricing is on the basis of the firm's goal and pricing on the basis of the product life cycle, cyclical pricing, multi-product pricing, Ramsey and transfer pricing and also uh, on the basis also we discuss about the retail pricing. So, generally the pricing strategy differs on the basis the on the basis whether the basis is cost, whether the basis is competition, whether the basis is product life cycle, whether it is on the basis of firm's goal or the objective or whether it is a transfer pricing. And uh, so, these are the topics for that is being covered in this uh, course managerial economics. So, to conclude or to give an end note we can say that that this course is an attempt to provide the understanding of basic economic theories, principle and concept and their application on the managerial decision problems.